Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. I'm Fabrizio Dilibotti, and I'm greatly honored to give this laudati of Daron Semoglu. Daron is a great economist, we all know. He's also a friend. So whatever I say will have to be adjusted by that, but in his case, it will not be a big adjustment. So Daron took his PhD at the London School of Economics in 1992. And describing his career is simple, because in 1993, he moved to MIT, and he has never moved again. It's much harder to report about his academic career. I have made here a very narrow selection of the awards and honors. And if I try to read them all, my 15 minutes will be gone. So he has an uncountable number of honorary doctorates, including Greek and the Turkish universities, which is uh, quite something, given the difficult relationship of these two countries. Uh, about 50 honorary lectures. Um, let me zoom on two of these prizes. One is the John Bates Clark Medal, which is uh, given uh, in the United States uh, uh, to the best economist under 40 years of age. Uh, you have this, uh, again, selected list of winners. And then Daron uh, received this prize in 2005. And in 2012, he was awarded the Nemers Prize at Northwestern University, another very prestigious uh, prize. Well, go through this list. I've made a selection, admittedly. But I could notice two things. First of all, I can name 18 Nobel Prize winners. And second, only two people have got both. One is Daniel McFadden, one is Daron. And recall, there are markets for betting on future Nobel laureates. But let's change topic. Let's talk about the influence of Daron in the profession. Many of you may recognize this uh, young, some not so young anymore, people. Daron has had 72 advisees, something that as a career record would be per se impressive, and I don't think Daron uh, uh, intends to stop here, so he will uh, break this uh, uh, every year. Here again, 72 names would be a long list and I let you read and uh, uh, recognize some of these people. I, I'm sure I'm being unfair in putting one, not the other. I did a selection of people I, I know. As I mentioned, Daron I and I have known each other for quite a long time. In fact, uh, I first met him in 1990 when I moved to the LSE to do first the master and then the, the, the PhD. So when I first entered the seminar room, I realized that uh, there was a lot of intellectual interaction, but there were two guys who were asking a lot of questions, and speakers weren't always good at answering them. So I didn't know either of them. I learned that one was Professor John Harman Moore, which was one of the persons uh, that attracted me to go to the LSE. And then there was another gentleman, and I asked, who is this, this, this guy? Oh, that's just a student. So, well, I decided to talk to him. And over some time, over the years, we uh, wrote a paper that originated actually in graduate school, uh, which uh, accommodated uh, some ancient uh, Greek myth. But in this room, I see it's appropriate. Uh, the title of the paper was, was Prometheus Unbounded by Chance. And it's one of these papers where those people who write about uh, crazy things we do in economics would have an easy life. Because we argue, first of all, what is Prometheus for us? We, have, we refer to David Land, so it's uh, the Industrial Revolution is economic development. Well, we argue that a very important element is luck, chance. So better be lucky than unlucky if you want to make fun of uh, what we did. But uh, you know, uh, someone before us uh, thought about that. It was my fellow countryman, Niccolò Machiavelli, who thought that for 50% ch 
chance matters, and for the remaining 50%, it's uh, humans who determine the course of nature. And in fact, we don't only point at chance, we talk about markets, financial development, governments, and such things. In fact, we come up with the idea of uh, appropriate uh, institutions at the time. Here is my fellow countryman, Niccolò Machiavelli, and I'm moving to another uh, point, which is not so easy. What is Daron's field of research? I know that he has been uh, granted the honor today for a particular reason, but if you ask that question, you will have not an easy time in answering. Well, you could be broad and say economics and politics. That's very broad, admittedly. Well, if you try to be more precise, you run again into some space problem. These are the fields where he has contributed, and I'm sure I'm missing many. And the picture is uh, Leonardo da Vinci for some reason. Political economy, economic development and growth, and so on and so forth. Well, somewhere I had to start to give uh, an overview of uh, his work in this limited time. So I thought that one possibility was to go to his most important articles. Which one? Well, I do something we sometimes do. I went to Google Scholar and said, well, let's see how many articles have attracted at least 1,000 citations. You know how hard it is to do that. Can't be so many. Not so sure. Here is how many of the articles Daron has written have attracted, and like there are not the books and other, other things he has done, uh, have attracted at least 1,000 citations, and some, many more. So, uh, In fact, uh, I would, I've tried to put them together in two areas. Uh, the, certainly institutions and long-run development, uh, where he has worked with uh, Simon Johnson, uh, Jim Robinson, or both, depending on the particular article. Then you find some of his uh, trademark articles. He has also uh, written a number of uh, very successful papers on technological change and productivity, some with illustrious, some with less illustrious co-authors. But let me come to the uh, three of uh, the papers that belong to the first of these two lines of research, also thinking about the theme of uh, uh, the cycle of lecture that Ron will give. Well, this is the famous article on the colonial origins of comparative development. I understand that it has already been mentioned. Well, the goal of this paper is to understand where, what the main determinants of economic growth and inequality of income across nations? And the answer is institutions. The authors argue that some societies have adopted institutions and policies that encourage economic growth, while others have blocked technological progress and institutional changes, condemning much of their population to poverty. Well, Somehow, we have always had the feeling that that is true, but we have never had a way of assessing how serious and how important that hypothesis is, because institutions are endogenous, and we would like to understand the causal effect of institutions. One problem is that as economies develop, their institutions tend to improve. So there is a somehow a virtuous circle that links development and institution. So, as a mogul Johnson Robinson proposed to go back to the patterns of colonization and institu institutional legacies. They argue and they document that Europeans' colonization strategy differed across areas and identified two patterns. One is extractive colonies, in which Europeans just try to extract resources or tribute from labor. And the second is settler colonies, where Europeans set up institutions under which they themselves would live. And for that reason, they try to establish uh, a good system of property right protection, political representation of the settlers that avoid the risk to be themselves abused in future. 
What's the determinant of this colonization strategy, extractive versus settler colonies? Well, they think they, they, they have this brilliant idea to look at the conditions, and in particular, at the disease condition that prevailed at the time of colonization. Mortality rates. In some areas, there was malaria, yellow fever, and the life expectancy of, of settler would be very low. This would not be a good place to settle. Now, how do they translate this in econometric approach? Well, they propose an instrumental variable strategy that exploits the variation in the potential European settler mortality rates. And they document the following. First, that there is a strong effect of mortality, of early mortality on early institution. Second, that early institutions tend to persist. And third, through its impact on today's institution, mortality has a first order effect on current development patterns. So something that happened a long time ago and for reasons that arguably, uh, or not arguably, that are exogenous, uh, they uh, have an impact on today's standard of living in terms of large differences. Well, another hypothesis that has been popular in the literature is that it's not so much institutions or that perhaps institution is not such a primitive determinant, it's rather geography, climate. This hypothesis goes back at least to Montesquieu. Well, uh, Asimoglu, Johnson, and Robinson in a companion paper document that that hypothesis have hard time in explaining some dynamics of economic development. Because if there is something that doesn't change over time, it's geography. Instead, the pattern of success of economic countries have been subject to important reversal. In fact, many countries that were prosperous and advanced before 1500 are today relatively less advanced. And they argue that the reversal is consistent with an institutional explanation because Europeans were more likely to set up extractive institutions in places which denser, with denser population, there was more labor to exploit and to produce goods to extract. Whereas places like North America, which were more sparsely populated, attracted more European settlers. These were the poor places at the time. The reversal, they document, took place mostly in the 18th and 19th century and was associated with the process of industrialization. So the process of industrialization created the condition for an economic takeoff. And after we have seen inequality growing across uh, countries, and that inequality has its roots in institutions, and notice, not, in, not uh, in the initial conditions, but in how the initial conditions shaped institutional development in earlier days. Another paper that I very much like is uh, partly because it deals with Europe uh, and the long term development of Europe is the rise of Europe, Atlantic trade, institutional change, and growth, published in 2005. There, they explain why the development within Europe has been unequal, with south and east part of Europe lagging behind, something that, for someone coming from Italy, sadly so, is still true today. Well, the key factor, they argue, is the access to trading and colonization opportunities, which open up that was opened up by the discovery of the new world and the rounding of the Cape of Good Hope. Now, these new economic opportunities have very, had very different effect in different countries. In some places, they strengthen the pre-existing institution. In particular, in Spain and Portugal, they strengthen absolutism. And so the early maritime success of this country then led to a subsequent decline. Instead, in uh, countries like the United Kingdom, uh, these uh, discoveries uh, enrich groups which manage to constrain the power of monarchs. In particular, they enriched independent mercants and fuel their rebellion against absolutism. On a more general ground, and my wife is Spanish and she likes this part of the story, uh, Daron argues that it's not important who co colonized different parts of the world but how colonization took place. In fact, there is a myth in uh, you know, kind of uh, uh, common wisdom and uh, also in some uh, uh, historians' account that, uh, even in some economists, in fact, that 
the, the big difference is between British colonization and, uh, and the rest. A lot of Anglo-Saxon writers spouse, spouse this view. British colonization was a carrier, supposedly a carrier of civilization. It brought liberalism, constitutional monarchy, common law, education, and British moderation. And Spain instead brought inquisition, enslavement, ethnic cleansing of natives, bigotry. Uh, France brought civil law, uh, and then civil wars, and, and that, etc. Well, Daron disputes this view and showed that whenever a British colonizer faced the same condition as Spanish colonizer, they behaved pretty much in the same way. So it was the local condition that determined how different, the, the different pattern of colonization and not, not the origin of the different colonizers. In fact, empirically, <clears throat> if, you, uh, if you control from the, for the disease condition at the time of colonization, the effect of colonial origin either vanishes or becomes very weak. And uh, Daron and Jim Robinson had put together this uh, body of knowledge and also expanded uh, through a series of impressive accounts in their book, The Origins of Power, Prosperity, and uh, Poverty, that uh, uh, has become a bestseller and is widely acclaimed. I want to end my presentation and uh, let Daron speak. Uh, by talking about two general laws on which Daron has been, that Daron has been discussing. Neither originate from him. The first originate from a book that Thomas Piketty published uh, in 2013, and you certainly have heard because it's also a bestseller, titled Capital in the 21st Century. I must say that Daron, Thomas, and Philippe were, in, were together in graduate school, so we, uh, we know each other well, and, uh, uh, and I, I have the highest intellectual respect uh, also of uh, uh, Thomas. But, uh, well, it's a very ambitious book because it, it goes after general laws of capitalism. So it goes really after the big picture. So there are two questions there. Do we need general laws of capitalism? And if so, did Thomas nail them down? Well, uh, in a recent article, um, Daron and Jim Robinson question uh, that this is the case. In fact, uh, they take uh, uh, the empirical evidence of two countries that are partic particularly interesting for their dynamic of income distribution, South Africa and Sweden. One of the points of Thomas is that uh, the key variable for determining the dynamics of inequality should be the, in, the, 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 the comparison, the difference between the interest rate and the rate of economic growth. Well, they show that in these two cases, they are essentially unrelated. They also question that looking at the top 1% share of the income inequality is informative. In fact, uh, overall income inequality behaves very different from the inequality in this uh, top share. The co their conclusion is that uh, actually they also document that instead the dynamic of institutions uh, is much, as much uh, stronger uh, explanatory power for these countries. And they conclude that it is impossible to understand the dynamics of inequality without systematically bringing in institutions and politics and their endogenous evolution. The second law is the law of 10,000. This could be said on the importance of being a semoglum. I'm reporting here a typical article that uh, you can find. You know, I, I happen to be an editor. I've been for a while. So perhaps to say it's representative, it's excessive. But uh, you know, this is the first page. References, semoglu daron. You come down, and there is only one article, the last one in this page, that has does not have Daron has, uh, as a first author. In fact, let me now reveal, the law of 10,000, as I call it, refers to the fact that every year, at least now, in future, I'm sure that will be also be broken, but every year, Daron's work receives uh, something more than 10,000 citations. So, you know, 
That means that uh, every day there are 30 people who are writing their own semoglu somewhere in their, in their article. Okay, so how do we explain this? The first is that Daron is very clever. That's, uh, but that's, you know, as economists, we would find that, uh, that theory a bit dull. So I'm going to propose another theory, which I think is the strongest challenge to this uh, dull theory. Here is a letter that was written by a colleague, in fact, not, uh, not, not a colleague of mine, someone, uh, an, a UK economist, on May, uh, published by The Times on May 20, 2010. I read it. Sir, alphabetic privilege extends beyond prime ministers and head boys and girls. In the economic profession, those who win the Nobel Prize or who gain tenure in the best departments are significantly more likely to have surnames early in the alphabet. Of course, some people with names starting with A may succeed on merit as well. In economics, the norm is for academic papers to have their authors listed alphabetically. Note, Daron is not only starts with A. After the A, he has a C. And the human brain dictates that the first author, and I was pleased, that I was using an example. In a paper by Armstrong and Tilibotti, let alone in a paper by Armstrong et al., is recalled more easily than the second. Thus, alphabetically advantaged scholars tend to come to mind when deciding whom to hire or invite to give a big lecture, like today. And these scholars prosper. Here is the look of 10,000, and many thanks for your attention. Ja, wir kommen zur Preisverleihung. Ich lese vor, das Center for Economic Studies der Ludwig-Maximilians-Universität vergibt unter der Präsidentschaft von Prof. Dr. Bernd Huber, meiner Wenigkeit und nach Auswahl des Beirats des CES, vertreten durch seinen Vorsitzenden Prof. Rick van der Pluch, an Prof. Daron Asimoglu, Elizabeth and James Killian, Professor of Economics, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, Cambridge, USA, den Preis des Distinguished CES Fellow 2015. Das CES zeichnet damit seine maßgeblichen Forschungsarbeiten auf dem Gebiet der politischen Ökonomie aus und benennt ihn zum Sprecher der Munich Lectures in Economics des Jahres 2015. Herzlichen Glückwunsch. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thank you, Fabrizio.